You're watching City Channel 4, your window to our community. I want to begin by just uh, expressing my own personal sense, but I think I'm speaking for the group and expressing uh, really admiration and gratitude to our speakers and panelists this morning. And I, I, I think this was absolutely extraordinary. I'm going to introduce Jerry in just a moment, but uh, I want to just say, take this opportunity to, <clears throat> to, to say a few things. First of all, uh, I want to thank the planning committee who organized today's forums. Uh, the members of the planning committee are Matthew Wolf, whom you mentioned, who you, whom you met as the moderator of the last panel. Matthew is the new executive director of the Iowa UNA and is doing a terrific job. The other members of the planning committee are Dorothy Paul, John Fraser, Nancy Porter, Jared Gilmore, and Katie Hansen. <clears throat> and so, thank you to all of them. I want to remind you that our forum today is actually the first in a series of forums, similar forums around the state. Uh, we are having a forum next Saturday on April 25th in Pella at Central College, in Cedar Falls on May 18th, in Cedar Rapids on September 17th and in Des Moines on October 23rd, and we're working on other, other locations. Each one of these forums is somewhat different depending on the interests of the local organizer and the resources in the local community. Uh, if you have friends living in those communities, or if you'd like to attend yourself, there is uh, more information on the Iowa UNA website, which is www.iowauna.org. I want to say a word about speaking to the choir. Um, as, as, as the choir director, I guess I, I have a, a stake in this question. I, I think we are speaking to the choir, but I think that's great because uh, the members of the choir need reinvigoration. I think all of us, even as members of the choir, are learning a lot uh, about this topic. Uh, my friend John Fraser said that uh, speaking to the choir is fine, but we always have to be enlarging the choir. So I hope that this, this forum provides us with some, both some information and some inspiration to do that. And I'd also say that uh, it's not every day that we get all of the members of the choir, or many members of the choir, together in the same house of worship. And so a lot of you are working on different aspects of this topic. I, I hope this has been an opportunity for you to learn each other. I'm especially excited that we've had a multi-generational group, and so we've had some sharing of ideas across generational lines. And so with that, I, I, it is my pleasure to introduce our luncheon speaker, Jerry Schnoor. Jerry is the co-director of the Center for Global and Regional, Regional Environmental Research at the University of Iowa, and he holds the Allen S. Henry Chair in Engineering. He is a professor both in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering and the Department of Occupational and Environmental Health. He has had a very distinguished career as a scholar and public speaker on environmental and climate change issues. In 2007, uh, Governor Chet Culver appointed Jerry to head the Iowa Climate Change Advocacy Committee, which produced a final report, uh, and that report is actually listed on the green resource list, which we distributed. I will say that Jerry is a longtime friend of the Iowa United Nations Association, both a friend and a supporter, and he has worked with us uh, in many ways, including assembling delegations of Iowans who have attended several of the meetings of the Conference of Parties on the UN Framework for uh, Climate Change, it, most recently the meeting which was held in Copenhagen in 2009. Jerry will be in Europe this fall, and he will be attending the Paris Conference in December. So uh, given his, his expertise and his close uh, involvement with these negotiations, 
Uh, we look forward to hearing his comments on the prospects for the Paris negotiations. And so please join me in welcoming Jerry. Thanks, Jerry. It's a pleasure to be here today. And I am indeed speaking to the choir. Uh, I know just about everybody, and it feels like home. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to talk about a few different things. I hope they're not disparate. Rather, what's happening in Iowa with respect to climate change or what has happened. What's happening currently at the United Nations. And at the beginning, just a little primer on climate change, though uh, Peter Thorne has addressed much of it this morning in that excellent talk. Peter, thank you. So this is, I think, Iowa, the United Nations, and climate change are all located in this particular slide somewhere. This is the uh, planet which we're trying to protect for our children and our children's children's children. And uh, the thin veneer that you might be able to see, uh, the skin of the Earth is only about 50 miles wide and uh, difficult to even see on this uh, slide, but it's the atmosphere. And that's a very actually small compartment, which is relatively easy to change when you have more than 7 billion people on Earth and industry increasing at about 4% each and every year. The problem with that is shown in this slide. Ever since the first time we took <laughs> students under the auspices of the Iowa United Nations Association, uh, to a conference. It was in 1992, the Rio Earth Summit. It's almost at the origin of this particular slide. We've been, we've been hearing uh, roughly 100 and more than 150 countries arguing about turning this uh, curve upside down, turning this frown upside down, uh, such that uh, we need to begin to decrease, first level off, and then decrease our greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a tall order. So we've been arguing now for more than 20 years at all of these meetings, and we've had the chance to uh, observe that. Maybe also disconcerting is that if we continue business as usual, that's the pink line shown on this curve. But uh, if you listen to all the leaders who come to these meetings, it's the gray line the pledges. So we have pledges now, but even the pledges don't begin to level it off and turn it around. More about that later. So uh, because our emissions continue to go up, we're burning uh, fossil fuels that took more than, in some cases, more than 300 million years to form in the Earth's crust. We're digging them up, we're burning them, in just the blink of an eye in geologic time, of course you're gonna change that thin veneer that we saw on the slide of the Earth. It's such a small reservoir, you're gonna change its chemistry. And indeed we are. It wouldn't matter too much. You may notice this is parts per million. That's a trace gas, carbon dioxide. It wouldn't matter too much, but that carbon dioxide is a radiatively important trace gas. That means when you use the atmosphere as the reservoir for your exhaust, which is what we're doing, then that affects the energy balance of the Earth. And that's what we call climate change. So as Peter Thorne said, this is the 2014 uh, fifth assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, uh, under the auspices of the United Nations, I might put in a plug, uh, which shows our temperatures uh, increasing since 1850 and most prominently since 1980, such that the bottom graph shows that 1980s were warmer than any previous decade in the instrumental record. 1990s were warmer than that. 2000s were warmer than that. And now the 2010s are uh, rivaling uh, the warmth. So. Uh, we believe that since 1980, the signal has emerged from the noise. That means that these gases, which uh, Burns Weston reminded me to mention, they have a long half-life in, in the atmosphere, over 100 years, many of them. So we're setting up, you can think of what we're doing now is based on the emissions over the past 100 years. We've already set that in motion. 
and we're going to have more warming even if we could stop all emissions tomorrow. We've set the system up. With very high confidence, um, uh, as scientists we say 95% confidence that it's warming and it's due to humans. I tell my students if you flipped a coin four times in a row and expected it to come up heads, that would be a 5% probability. You'd have to do that if you did it 100 times, four times in a row, it would come up heads four times, only 5%. That's the confidence. We have 95% confidence, so many uh, data pointing the same direction that this is due to us. It's coming from satellites. It's coming from surface measurements. It's coming down borehole measurements of wells. It's coming from the fossil record. It's coming from the ice melting. It's coming from temperature measurements in the atmosphere uh, on land. All of these data sets pointing the same direction, that it's warming and that it can only be explained by humans. One of the smoking guns for me is the recent data. We've got really good data since 1995 on the oceans. Now, it hasn't been mentioned today, but 93% of the extra heat from this blanket of greenhouse gases that we're putting around the Earth, 93% of it is going into the oceans. That's because the heat capacity and the mass of the oceans are so great. It's really the oceans where you should look for what we're doing. And indeed, you can see it. It's a top-down signal going down 700 meters in the North Atlantic, 2,000 meters in many locations. You can see the warming from top down can only be explained by first the warming of the atmosphere and then the subsequent. About 3% of the warming goes into the land mass, about 3% into the melting of the ice. There's a latent heat of fusion, as you know, to melt the ice. That takes 3% of the warming. And about only 1% goes into war the warmer atmosphere. It's really all about the oceans. Well, since 1995, we launched 3,000 sons called the Argold buoys to measure very accurately all the energy that's coming into the oceans and going out from the oceans. If you go online on your computer or your smartphone and type in Argo, you can see where it's now 3,600 buoys that we have. You can see where they're currently floating. They're solar powered, they come up every couple of weeks, re-energize their batteries and then go through a programmed descent down to 2,000 meters. Now we have some that go even deeper than 2,000 meters. So since 1995, we began to really have an excellent record of how much heat is going into the oceans. And uh, it's about, it's roughly a watt per square meter. To be more exact, about 0 0.7 watts per square meter. Now, a little twinkle light on your Christmas tree is roughly one watt. So we're talking about one watt on every square meter, about like this desk here, every square meter of the earth, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year uh, on. And that actually is a lot of energy. It's so much energy, it's 20 times more than all the fossil fuels and all the primary nuclear and all the primary energy consumption on earth, 20 times more than that is the amount of heat we're adding as a legacy for our children and our children's children. So the oceans are definitely warming up. This is a measure of the, from NOAA of the analysis of the Argo data, and you can see uh, it's uh, 10 to the 23rd joules. That's, a, that's an awful lot of heat, but again, 20 times more than all that we're burning. That's because the sun's energy is so great and we're magnifying a fraction of the sun's energy, uh, which is uh, so much. Holly Berkowitz asked me to say that the sun's energy easily could provide all our energy needs. Uh, in fact, uh, Dennis Hayes, the founder of Earth Day, which is on, is that Tuesday or coming up Wednesday, uh, is fond of saying that uh, there's no country on Earth that uses more energy than that which strikes its buildings every day. No country on earth that uses more energy than... So if we can find a skin just for our buildings, we'd have plenty of uh, electricity. 
That's Holly. She's my fan. <laughs> so the oceans you can see are warming. If you smear this red color, uh, it's about one degree Fahrenheit warmer in my lifetime, in the last 50 years. I, I mentioned that at the outset that the thin veneer of an atmosphere is difficult to see and it's small on the Earth picture, but the oceans are huge, 70% of the Earth's surface. I never would have guessed as a student at Iowa State University back in the day, I never would have guessed that we could possibly change the oceans in our lifetime, but we are. And uh, they're, they're considerably warmer. This is the sea surface temperature. More surprising is the fact that the uh, reason they're warmer Carbon dioxide, especially of the green of the many greenhouse gases, uh, is also a weak acid. It's like the uh, suds uh, bubbles when you crack open a Coca-Cola. That's carbon dioxide, and it's a weak acid when you dissolve it in water. And uh, it's acidifying the oceans. I never would have thought that we could possibly, in my lifetime, acidify the entire oceans, but we are. The pH has changed during that period from about 8.2 to about 8.08. I see Peter Hansen, our chemistry professor right here in the front row, he'll remind you that that's a logarithmic scale, like the Richter scale, and that's actually about a 34% increase in acidity in our lifetime, if you can imagine. That's what we're doing. Uh, global warming, as people call it, or, or climate change, you know, it's really two distinct, it's many problems, but it's two distinct problems. It's the problem of the change in the energy budget due to the blanket that we're putting over the earth. That's pretty well known. But maybe to me, even a more compelling story is this one, that it's also the problem that CO2 is a weak acid and is acidifying the entire planet, the base of all life. So if you're a small creature that needs to make uh, calcium carbonate or aragonite is the, uh, is the mineral for a shell, uh, like a diatom uh, in the ocean, or a sea coral or a coral reef, you're hard pressed to be able to do that. And by the end of this century, the pH will be about 7.8 in the ocean, almost thermodynamically impossible to make a shell at that pH. We're really messing with the basic building blocks of life here. The latest story has been alluded to earlier, and that is the sea level change that affects so many people. Uh, Uday Kumar mentioned about Bangladesh, and uh, we could have 700 million refugees by the end of the, environmental refugees, flooded out of their uh, island nation, flooded out of the coastline as a result of sea level rise. The new story here is, again, it may not sound like much, but right now it's about three millimeters a year, about three centimeters a decade, a little more than an inch in a decade. But it's really not that sea level rise that's the concern, it's the storm surge associated with uh, uh, Typhoon Haiyan in uh, the Philippines. It's the storm surge is magnified greatly by this rising sea level. And what's more, the new story is that the sea level is rising at a much faster rate than it has historically. And this acceleration is due to the melting ice. We're on our way in a few hundred years to being an ice-free planet. The ice is melting and it's being added to the ocean. Greenland alone is melting at a rate of about half of Lake Erie each year. So all of that is now going and increasing the rise in sea level. So the projections, you might see all the instrumental data. We have good satellite data. You know, these are gravimetric. Newton's law of universal law of gravitation. This is how we measure it. We can get very excellent measurements of the ice mass by the deviation in between the gravitational pull of the ice as the satellite goes over Antarctica and the satellite itself. So these are by differential gravitational measurements. We have excellent measurements of the ice. We know it's melting, and we know even the mass that's being added to the uh, ocean as a result. And because of this in increase in the land-based ice melting, the glaciers and the uh, Greenland and the ice shelves of Antarctic, it's accelerating, as you can see in this plot here. 
Well, we're moving now from the climate change and from the globe to uh, United States, and we're heading towards Iowa. And I just remind you that uh, part of climate change has to do with wet areas are getting wetter and dry areas are getting drier in general all over the world. There's good climatological reasons for that, but at the current time, California is suffering a, a, a record drought, certainly an instrumental record. It started in 2011, and uh, it's very serious in terms of how it affects their people, the species, and their uh, economy. Also, uh, West Texas and Oklahoma, for the first time, are practicing direct, we call it direct potable reuse, direct treatment of their wastewater, recycling it around a drink for the first time ever. Why? Because necessity is the mother of invention. They have to. They don't have any other source of water. In Iowa, now we're honing in on Iowa, we have uh, 180 researchers, thank heavens, who are interested and active in uh, trying to assess this problem for Iowans and maybe interpret it a little bit. Uh, 38 colleges and universities, Peter Thorne mentioned it earlier, he's been a leader last year, especially on the health uh, statement. This year it's about what we should ask our um, the people who come to Iowa who are running for office, the questions we should ask them. 2013, it was on agriculture, and 2012, it's on climate science. If you go to uh, our Sea Greer Center for Global and Regional Environmental Research website, you can get all of the statements if you're interested. This is Gene Tockley uh, last year, and Peter Thorne, our morning speaker, and Dave Osterberg, the pensive scholar on the right. <laughs> Well, as you know, and has been mentioned, Iowa has experienced basically warmer and wetter conditions in the past 100 years or so. You can see it pretty clearly in our meteorological records and uh, increased intense uh, precipitation. That's resulted in floods in uh, kind of 100-year floods or more rare, 1993, 2010, 2013, 2014, punctuated by a drought in 2012. That's sort of what the models would indicate we can expect in the future. More and more flood type years from intense precipitation, occasionally punctuated by drought. In 2007, it was mentioned that I, I was part of the Iowa Climate Change Advisory Council. That was a, under Governor Chest Culver to report to the General Assembly and to the governor on policy options. And, we did that. Mike Carberry was active in that process, and Peter Thorne, and, and Rob Hogue, and many others in this room. Uh, and we, I actually think it's not a bad report. We reviewed 54 options, and more about 20 of them or more would have saved money over about a six-year period. But really, the report was kind of dead on arrival, and uh, there's been no real implementation of the report. But it was followed up in 2009 uh, by the Iowa General Assembly asking the simple question, well, tell us so far what are the impacts on Iowa? Uh, the previous report was about what are the solutions. Now just tell us what are the effects on Iowa. And these are some of the authors shown on this slide of this particular report, which is also available online from the DNR website or from the, our center's website. Some of the recommendations in that report were that we need, uh, now they seem kind of like, duh, of course, uh, but they, we should harden our infrastructure. Iowa City alone, and Coralville, I'm not sure of the numbers, but Iowa City alone has since that time spent over $100 million in doing just that, beginning to raise up our electrical substations at water and wastewater treatment plants so they no longer get flooded, uh, strengthening bridges so they no longer fall down, replacing railroad and strengthening railroad bridges, raising highways, you get the idea. And that's what has to be done. But especially our committee said that uh, Iowa soil is really its, uh, its resource and, and richness. Uh, the history here, it depends on our soil, and we need to think more about protecting that. And I think uh, 
hopefully that will uh, go on. We need to invest in our wildlife habitat, mentioned earlier in the uh, panel. We need to report on the health effects as Peter Thorne has begun uh, to do for us today. Uh, mandate federal highway design standards. Uh, this is a federal problem, not a, not a statewide problem, but we need such. And we should have the insurance industry, by the way, who are mm, believers in climate change and actuarially know it quite well, we need them to report to us what do they know and how should we prepare ourselves, even from an insurance standpoint, uh, to adapt to the future. We are going to have more. We're already experiencing climate change, but we're just at the beginning of this, folks. It's going to get worse, and we've already set in motion uh, that it's going to get worse. Hopefully, we can begin to stave off the worst possible repercussions. There's some good news I'm here to tell you about. Uh, the United States emissions, I'll show you in a moment, uh, have begun to decline. Uh, it started in the recession, 2007-2008, but it has continued uh, to decline after that. Iowa's emissions, for the first time in 2012-2013, have begun to decline. We were kind of laggards. And the reason that Iowa's emissions have begun to decline, it's pretty clear, is due to the wind energy that we've uh, implemented. And so uh, uh, probably the, our senators in the audience can tell us wh exactly why that has happened, but it has been a good thing from the standpoint of the states. Of <laughs> this is one way to affect uh, progress. Uh, we, when, when I chaired the Iowa Climate Change Advisory Council, 78% uh, of our power was coming from coal-fired electricity. Today, it's 59% of our power. That's a huge change in a short period of time. Uh, good for us. There's some good news. I'm going to tell now a little bit about the United Nations, given that this is a UNA uh, meeting. And there's several people in the audience who could probably tell this story much better than I. Burns Weston, Dorothy Paul, Diane Dillon Ridgely, uh, to name just a few. But I'll permit me to try to give a little history before we talk about what's happening now at the United Nations level. The very first environment meeting you may know was 1972, a Stockholm environment uh, conference, uh, which uh, I didn't get to go to. Was I born then? Oh, yeah. I was at Iowa <laughs> State University then. But the first one that I took students to under the auspices of the Iowa UNA was the Rio Earth Summit, and many in this room uh, went with us. We had, I don't know, maybe 20 students all together, and uh, we were all um, uh, delegates of a parallel forum, which has sort of fallen out of favor these days, but the NGOs had a parallel forum. We, were all, uh, we all had delegation uh, badges under the United Nations Association. 172 countries participated. There was great concern whether President Bush uh, the first, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, would go to the meeting, and indeed he did. Uh, 108 heads of state were present. It was a landmark meeting in that the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was signed and signed by the United States and ratified by the United States. That's why we're a party, thank heavens that we did that, that's why we're a party to all that is going on uh, today, even though Subsequent agreements we did not uh, ratify. Agenda 21, the Rio Declaration, the UN Convention on Biodiversity, all still have life uh, as a result of that meeting. The next uh, important meeting was the Kyoto Protocol for Climate Convention. You may recall that at the 11th hour, uh, we sent Vice President Al Gore to try to convince, the, to try to get an agreement and also to try to convince the U.S. delegation that we should be party to it. And uh, they were successful to the extent that we got an agreement, much by design of the United States, uh, and we signed it, but we did not ratify that one. So uh, we were not party to the actual emission reductions that had to uh, go on. They went from 2008 to 2012. They were targeted to reduce emissions globally at 5%. They did not do that because of the growth of other countries who 
who are not signatory. And uh, they were extended uh, for a while under the Doha round of uh, talks and are now extinct. The Copenhagen uh, Agreement, uh, we also took students to and were present uh, in this organization. Here the goal was to stop the dangerous interference with climate. And for the first time it was defined. So uh, I would say the meeting was not a great success because the ultimate goal was to stop dangerous interference with climate. But at least we defined what would be mm, a definition of stopping it as uh, no more than a two degrees Celsius increase in global temperatures from pre-industrial levels. So at least we had a definition. We had mixed results. It was called the Copenhagen Accord. And uh, it at least from our standpoint, uh, we're party to it because we signed the framework convention and we continued to uh, exert some leadership, I would say, through uh, Hillary Clinton and Obama did go to that meeting. One of the things that came about in Copenhagen was the realization that all countries are going to have to participate because China and India and developing countries are coming on strong as uh, important contributors to greenhouse uh, gases. And uh, this is a little small, but maybe I can explain it. There was a realization that Annex I countries, that's the rich countries like ours, were going to have to make pretty significant reductions and do it soon to stem two degrees Celsius increase. That's about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit increase. We're currently at about 1.4 or 1.5 degree Fahrenheit increase on the way to that uh, 3.6. But uh, rich countries would have to, by 2020, that's only five years from now, have a 25 to a 40 percent reduction in emissions. Wow, that's steep. That's rough. And by 2050, an 80 to 95 percent. Basically, it says we have to get out of the fossil fuel age. If we're going to lick this problem, we've got to turn towards renewables and energy efficiency. Maybe nuclear, like was mentioned earlier, but we can't continue with business as usual. The other interesting thing, though, and I think this is lost on most Americans even today, and it came about uh, from the run-up to Copenhagen, that is that all the, the United Nations recognizes that all countries have to be involved in this, and we all have to help each other. They recognize that clearly. And so the non-Annex one, the developing countries, also already need in 2020 to have a substantial deviation from baseline and a substantial and a greater deviation by 2050. That's recognized. We're all in this together. I'm happy to say there has been progress, not only in Iowa, uh, we're kind of a laggard, but in the United uh, States with reducing our emissions. It's shown here by the black line. You can see that our peak was in about mm, the late 1990s. We, we are currently at about 1994 emission levels. So we haven't gotten back to 1990 emission levels yet, but you can see it's going down. And uh, in Copenhagen, Obama pledged, he originally said 15% by 2020, he changed it to 17% by 2020, that's currently our pledge. We, and we're on a track to make it, as you can see, by the orange dashed line and the black line here. And more recently, that's a, that is real good news. <laughs> by three ways, energy efficiency, uh, controls on power plants, which the Supreme Court uh, supported in 2007, and by uh, 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 what will turn out to be Obama's greatest achievement, getting all the automobile manufacturers together to agree on uh, fuel efficiency standards. That's how we're doing this, those three ways. And what's more, he's more recently pledged, and I'll show you about that, to a 26 to 28 percent uh, uh, emissions reduction off of 2005 baseline levels, uh, more on that later, by 2025. Um, that was the first time it was mentioned. Our pledge, and by the way, this is a pledge. This has no, there's no teeth, there's no uh, buying, but it's got some soft, Burns Weston's taught me, it's got some soft law associated with it. 
you saw that we're on our way to doing it. I think we're going to uh, make it, at least unless there's a total reversal of those three policies that I just mentioned to you earlier. Energy efficiency, automobile efficiency uh, standards, and the uh, coal-fired power plants. Uh, in November of 2014, Obama and Xi Jinping uh, agreed to a very, what I think is a very important bilateral agreement. You may disagree and we can talk about it. But for the very first time, China, the world's largest now, the world's largest emitter, not historically, we're still historically the largest cumulative emitter, but the current largest emitter, China, for the first time said that they'll level off emissions. That's a huge concession for reasons I'll show you in a minute. And it's a bi, uh, bilateral agreement and by bilateral cooperation, sharing of technology between uh, the countries. Actually, a pretty remarkable agreement, to be honest with you. So uh, I, t I stole this graph from the uh, New York Times, and it didn't quite, on my Mac, it was OK, but it's not so good here. But anyway, this is in gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions, uh, the graph on the right. The red line is China. You can see that they passed up the U.S. Uh, some years ago, and they're rising very, very fast, trying to provide a better economic way of life for their people. Let's face it, folks, they've moved four, in, in the last 15 years, they've moved 400 million people out of poverty, as we define it in the United Nations. Unprecedented in life on Earth. 400 million people moved out of poverty, living on less than $1.25 a day in just a 15-year period. How have they done it? Well, certainly energy and CO2 emissions have contributed to it. You can see their line, and you can see why they're so important to try and get a grip on this problem. You can also see that the U.S. has begun to go down. You can see that the EU has gone down for some time now. They're below their 1990 levels. And uh, India, I, if I had a pointer, I could show you which one is India, but it's the gray line near the one uh, gigaton, which is coming up fast now. So India is one that has to be considered. China's pledge by Xi Jinping in November this year was to go from that red line by 2030 to that point I've got by China pledge. It's going to be very difficult to do because they're still going straight up. they got to level that off, bring it back down in order to make that pledge. So um, you may get the idea there's a theme here. There's a theme here about uh, some of the issues which are current in our newspapers right now. And the theme is uh, how do we govern ourselves as a planetary uh, body? And what does it mean when a leader makes a pledge. And can that pledge make a difference in the future? These are important questions. And can that pledge be reversed by future leaders or by uh, Congress, for example, in the United States? These are all key, critical questions. When George Herbert Walker Bush signed the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, I showed you that earlier, nobody questioned it. It went right through the Senate and was ratified. When Al Gore in 1997 went to Kyoto and got us to sign the Kyoto Protocol Accords on real reductions, everybody questioned it. The Senate, the United States Senate, that particular year voted 95 to nothing that they, would, they didn't get that junk out of here. We don't even want to see that treaty. Don't even bring it. And they didn't. They didn't even bring it. And so that, that's the, the interesting change that we've seen. And now, of course, even in Iran, the negotiations in Iran, all this question about what does it mean when the executive branch, when Obama and the executive branch negotiate a treaty, what does it really mean? Of course, if it's a formal treaty, the Senate has to ratify. So they try to get around that. That's the dance that's going on right now. And it, and it includes uh, the dance of the United Nations deliberations on climate as well. So these pledges, everybody's doing these pledges now. We've got a name for them, by the way. They're called INDCs. They're Intended National Determined Contributions. Every country is supposed to do it before November 30th uh, in Paris. 
Only the last time I looked, only eight had filed. U.S. is a leader again. We've filed. EU has filed. Uh, Brazil, Mexico, Gabon, uh, few others. Uh, and here's the pledges. They kind of go a little bit all over the place. Uh, the EU has said they'll uh, have a 40% emission reduction by 2030 compared to their baseline level in 1990. I just got Switzerland's last night. Theirs is 50%, so they've, they're doing better than the EU. They're an independent country. They're 50% uh, by 2030 uh, based on 1990 levels. Norway has pledged 40% based on 1990 levels. That was, by the way, the original reference year under the UNFCCC. Uh, but we've changed it. Obama has changed it to 2005. He's, it's a long story. But uh, that's part of the issue of bringing this all to a close and trying to make something out of it. Mexico says uh, they're going to do 25%, but uh, most of it's going to be in carbon black. They say short-lived is not in the agreement right now. Carbon black is both a human health effect as well as a warming agent. So Mexico says we're going to go after the carbon black first. It's not in your treaty negotiations but that's how we're gonna do it. So we gotta bring all this together in Paris by December 2015. And again, the final goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to limit the global temperature increase to two degrees uh, Celsius. And this whole notion of pledges, and what does it mean? Uh, we've got a name for it, INDC, but, and can they be sustained? Because for sure, in this country and many other countries too, the politics have become so partisan. I'm talking about Australia. It's not just us. I'm talking about Australia. Have you been following them? I'm talking about Canada. I'm talking about the UK. I'm talking about a lot of developed countries, including some in the, EU, in the EU. There's so much acrimony. What does it mean when a leader signs an agreement how do we make sure that that pledge be, becomes reality? And those are some of the things I think facing us. Because the first bullet here, a legally bind, this is what we want, a legally binding agreement by all nations. There's no way Obama is going to be able to take this agreement to the Senate. Forget it. It's, it's never going to go there. It's never going to be a legally binding treaty you know, passed through the Senate. So the question I have for you is, you know, what is the future? What does INDC mean? What can pledges be turned into reality? That's what we're facing, I think, in the Paris uh, talks. Peter Thorne and others have talked about what can we do? Well, certainly already we've seen that solar and wind in particular and energy efficiency can make a difference, but to be honest, it's not fast enough. We're not turning that curve upside down on a global basis. And so to do that, we have to have a fee and dividend or a carbon neutral uh, tax in which uh, the, uh, the maybe why tax our uh, payroll tax or our income tax, that's a tax on your productivity. Decrease that, increase the tax on uh, your unsustainability. Uh, carbon tax. <laughs> Or, or return it to the people. I, I, my wife and I just uh, had our identity theft stolen. Someone else filed our income taxes for us. More than 200 people at the university have had that same thing happen. I'm a little skeptical about returning checks to every, their energy checks, their carbon checks to everybody every single month. But maybe, maybe, it, can, maybe it can be worked out. Uh, but at any rate, we, uh, there have been examples British Columbia, go online and look them up. They have a 30% carbon tax now. They're the uh, most prosperous, lowest unemployment, best economy in all of Canada right now. M some economists attribute it to the carbon tax that they've implemented. It can work because the people who benefit are the ones who don't use so much carbon and it's revenue neutral in the British Columbia and they have more money to spend. It's taken off their income taxes, and they're spending it, and the economy is, is good. 
So there are examples of what we can do. We need good policy. And yes, we have to adapt because climate change is already here. It's going to get worse, folks, and hopefully not much worse if we mitigate the last thing on this slide. We have to begin to turn that curve upside down for all countries, not just the U.S. And we, the U.S. has to do it the fastest of all. We have the wherewithal and the economy to do that, and we're responsible for the most amount of emissions that are up there right now. There's some other good news. Uh, it's been alluded to. Uh, the New York Times had a poll uh, this year already uh, that, believe it or not, an overwhelming majority of Americans in the 70s, uh, including 48% of Republicans, uh, feel that we have to support government action to curb uh, climate warming. There's been movement on this. Uh, I think maybe we're back to where we were in the 2007s when McCain and Kennedy and others were sponsoring bills in Congress and we really thought, the nation thought at that time that we were gonna have comprehensive energy legislation and comprehensive climate change legislation. Something happened on the way to the forum between 2007 and now we can discuss what it's been, but we lost our way. Maybe, maybe we're coming back to it now. In conclusion, uh, climate change is already here. It'll be worse if we don't act to level off our emissions. We got to do it. Our, our time is running out. I'd say we have to do it in the next 15 years. Turn that global curve upside down. And uh, steep cuts after that. Got to get out of the fossil fuel economy. A hundred years from now, we'll look back on this time as, oh my God, those silly people, you know, Neanderthals, they were burning up all the coal, oil, and natural gas in the Earth's crust in just the blink of an eye in geologic time, and they were gassing themselves with air pollution at the same time. What a primitive system. That's how we'll look at it a hundred years from now. I was improving by wind. Uh, we need more, but we need solar. You know, this is a great place for solar. And it matches up so wonderful with wind. This is an economic opportunity for Iowa that we haven't even addressed yet. Uh, there are some good trends at developing. Uh, countries have already turned their curves upside down, but we have to make it faster in more countries. The UN process, thank God for the United Nations. At least they're talking about this stuff. And while you may get from me, I don't have much hope for a binding all-nation uh, treaty. I do have hope for this notion of pledges and what we can do with it in the future. Thanks very much. Channel 4. On TV, online, on demand, on Facebook, and now on the go on your mobile device.